With the first pick overall, the New Jersey Devils are proud to select from the U.S. program, Jack Hughes. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Jersey Joe Corner. It is brought to you by Big Heads Media. It is going to be a great hockey season uh, coming right up. A lot of interesting things. Uh, Anchor.fm will help you uh, start your podcast and get things rolling. It's going to be a lot smoother when you uh, when you get the Anchor app, and it's so much easier to navigate. Even their online website at anchor.fm is very efficient and you can do a lot of great things with it. Hey. Hey, I'm here. We're back. A uh, little technical issues. Just waiting for Anya to come on. The uh, We were in conversation with the NWHL PA director, uh, Anya Packer, um, just talking about expansion uh, for the NWHL up to Toronto. Uh, just waiting for her to reconnect to us. I guess we're having a little technical issue this morning. It's, uh, it's Monday. Yeah, it's definitely Monday. Uh, just to review, uh, I was on Raw Mike Richards this morning just talking about some hockey. We were talking sports, just seeing when <clears> things were coming back. Um, you know, just the you know, environment that we're living in right now. Uh, just having fun. You know, talk about the Instagram live. Ooh, and she is back on. And, and Anya's back on <laughs> after some technical issues technical this issues. morning. It is Monday. Uh, so we were just saying, trying to recap everybody. Uh, just give us your thoughts again on the expansion to Toronto. I know you said you were going north of the border, and then we lost you. <laughs> okay, good. Well, that I good that I yelled at my house for a long time for no reason. Um, I was saying I'm really excited to be north of the border. We've always been uh, trying to get to that market, and we're excited to welcome what will be a natural rival for both Buffalo and Boston with the Toronto franchise. So. We're excited for that. I think there's so many positives that come out of it, whether that's the growth of just high, you know, just high quality jobs for women that are going to pay them to be in sport. You know, we have an all female leadership group run by some pretty inspiring women as well. So just getting every single piece there set up has been, you know, some of the most exciting news that we've had all off season. I do think this is a great example. Like you use the NHL's rivalries as a Petri dish for the NWHL. Do you kind of see it as like a little testing ground for the women's game? Yeah, I think it's always great, right? Boston fans want to hate Toronto fans and Toronto <laughs> fans to their, you know, their their rivals down there in Buffalo. There's always so many good um, emotions that come out of it. If I can spin that story to have Connecticut, which formerly was Hart- Hartford, the Whalers uh, fans. Yeah, with Whalers fans disliking New York, New Jersey. I mean, that's that's awesome. Let's feed on that, right? <laughs> um, let's let's bring that tri-state rivalry back up. So <laughs> all of the the fun that we have in building these franchises and building long-term sustainable um, fan bases, because that's really what drives continued growth is just having viewership and people buying your merch and being involved and being invested. All of that comes from kind of like you said, piggybacking on what we know already works. We don't need to reinvent the wheel every time we hit the drawing board. Um, so often when we can play to a natural enemy, we're, we're doing a good job. Yeah, and I mean, look, the NWHL is going into uh, its sixth season now with the expansion. And I've been watching since day one. I'm a big fan of women's hockey. I'm a fan of all hockey. Um, I actually saw you uh, try out. Uh, one year when they had the tryouts in Newark down at the <laughs> Yeah, end. So I was, si- yes. I was sitting next to Dan Rice and I, I was like, Oh, 20 over here. I'm like, I'm really liking this player. He's like, yeah, she's going to be with the whale this year. I was like, Oh, cool. So I guess my <laughs> scouting eye was really good. Um, but you know, talking about more expansion, I know you guys moved to Twitch this year um, to watch games and that's been really helpful for me because I haven't been able to get down to, um, 
I've been to a couple games this year, but Bridgewater is just so far from where I live that it's easier to watch the games on Twitch. Just tell, us, uh, tell the audience about that, and where do you see that going from there? Yes, Twitch was an unbelievable partner this year. It was um, an introduction at a mixer to grow women's sports. And uh, that introduction turned into a really creative idea where Twitch has now started to uh, break into live sports. And it's a really interesting um, market for us to be a part of. You know, they are an absolute leader and innovator in e-gaming. And they've done such a tremendous job to create a very loyal fan base to Twitch. Now, bringing women's hockey into the fold, there's so many other pieces there. There's an, uh, a visibility that we're now introducing women's hockey to a group of very, very young and also super invested folks. So that's a good market for us to hit a new audience demographic as well as really thrive. We had over 8 million eyes on women's hockey this year. Wow. Wow. Um, <laughs> like that alone right there. like <laughs> That number is to, huge. That is that a great is, number. Yeah, it was huge. So we also, in, in that, we also had chats, thousands of chats every single game. So if you were catching a game and you didn't know who Madison Packer was or you didn't know about Packer to Leary and all this stuff in a, in a Riveters game, you could ask. You could say, who is Madison Packer or what's their power play percentage or what does this mean? Do they have the trapezoid rule? What's this? What's that? All these questions that you're now watching a community build itself. I mean, it was crazy. And then you watch people throwing bits at goals, which is like if someone could just throw a stack of money out when, uh, when, you know, Brad Marsh, I'm a Boston kid, so I'm going to Okay, just that's fine. I, 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 I no, 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 it's there. okay. No, 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 you can I didn't know if you guys were going to get mad. No, 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 you can. No, no, you can. Absolutely <laughs> No not. one can hate Patrice. So when Bergie no. scores a goal, that'd no. be like if someone grabbed a stack of cash and threw it out onto the ice. Yeah, no, absolutely. It was just a cool thing. Yeah, no, that's absolutely awesome. We actually have a good amount of listeners between the Tri-State area and, of course, New England and upstate New York. And we actually have a good following in uh, in Canada as well as – mostly in Ontario. So um, one of our listeners uh, is a Devils fan and he's going to be having a daughter soon in 11 weeks. So I said, Hey, your, your daughter one day could possibly play for the Riveters or the new Toronto expansion team. I said, think about it. That's, I mean, so those are the things that we always like, we, we look forward for, right? When I was a kid, I wanted to play in the NHL. I wanted to be on the bees. I wanted to, Play at BU. I mean, when I was a kid, Boston University didn't have a women's team. Um, I joined the team and we were only four years old. So I was a little kid with a Terriers jersey running around saying, I want to be on the Terriers, but there was no women's team. So now these little girls and, and boys can look at women's hockey and be like, that's a thing. You know, that's something I want to do. That's something I want to see. That's something I want to be fans of. And that's sick, you know? Like it, it's six years now. So somebody that was a sophomore or excuse me, a junior in high school knew that when they finished college, they could play pro. And that's really cool. And, and then it's like even cooler. Cause like Madison is now on a team with those age kids. And I'm like, babe, you're <laughs> old, but, but it's also just really inspiring. You know, you become what you want to see in the world. And then when that happens, these little girls that are future draft pick 20, 27 or 30, 50, whatever, like so young, <laughs> God, I, sometimes I feel so old, but, <laughs> it's, but they're just looking up at something that doesn't seem crazy to them. They don't know to think it's crazy. They just think it's real. And that's what we want. What I want to talk about as well, touch on another person in uh, the women's side of hockey is that Florence Schelling broke a barrier in the yeah. pro league in the NLA and the Swiss league. What do you think about people like that breaking the big barrier that was usually a men's role? Now she's talking about strategy uh, with SC Burn. I was just watching a video about that in German, understanding it th as an English speaker. So what do you think about her role in hockey? I think Florence Schilling has done something outstanding. Not only did I hate playing against her in college because she was at Northeastern when I was at BU, uh, no. Still there? Yeah, I'm here. I think we lost her again. Hopefully she comes back. I have a strong signal, so. Yeah, so do I. I don't know. It might be on her end. Her end. Yeah. Maybe too much use on the Wi-Fi on her end. I don't know, yeah. Our Wi-Fi is pretty strong. Hold on, we'll wait for it. 
All right, give it five minutes. Yeah, give it a minute. <laughs> he should be back. She was talking about Florence. Yeah. Oh, Ooh. he lost her. Yeah. Let me reinvite her. Yeah. Just we'll we'll stay on and I'll we'll stay on and we'll bring it back. Yeah. Some yeah. Some hold on a sec. Issues. Let, let me. Yeah. Hold on a sec. That's okay. We'll get through it. We'll get through it. Yeah. So she was talking about Florence Schelling um, basically breaking barriers over an SC burn, and she's going to get into more detail. They played against each other. She was at BU. Florence Schelling was in, with the Northeastern North Huskies, and the Huskies were a great uh, Oh, there franchise. we go. We got her back. And, and she's back. All right. When my phone Wi-Fi. locks, I lose you guys. I figured it out. Okay. <laughs> perfect. Okay. I can't uh, let it lock. I got it. All right. Perfect. Sorry. I just get on these crazy rampages. So <laughs> no, no. So, <laughs> so, so back at it. I was just trying to catch everybody up. So back at it, you guys, we talked about Florence Schelling breaking barriers. You were going into the fact that you didn't like playing with her, uh, <laughs> playing against her at, because, because she's good. That's she's why. good. No, she's good. She's excellent. Her. She's excellent. I saw her play. I saw her play at the Women's Worlds in Vermont in 2012. I could not believe how great she was, and she carried Swiss to uh, a bronze medal there. Yes, yeah, that was some sick. unbelievable hockey. Um, <laughs> it was great. I loved it. I loved the women's game. Like you can hear my enthusiasm yes. for it. <laughs> I just love yeah. it. She's so, really so good. I'm yeah. saying she's a good hockey player, right? And you can't yeah. take that away from her. But she's also an unbelievable person. And, you know, I don't know her personally, but I know of her and I've met her and I've been around her and she's just, she just emits this quality and she expects the quality back. And I think that that is really important. And when we watch women take on these leadership roles, especially in the men's game, as well as the women's game, you're going to start to see what that adds, what value a woman brings to sports, you know, and it's not, it's not nothing. And that can be pretty easy for someone to say, Oh, you know, I'm bored with women or I don't care. Or, you know, let's <laughs> no, no, stick no, to no. men, all these terrible things. But, but what she brings is so much more than, than you're going to find from any counterpart because she sees hockey or sports in general, uniquely different than anyone ever has because she's the first. And that's unbelievable. And that's something that should be recognized and applauded. And we should lean in on it because she's going to make so many strides there that nobody before her has thought about because she's compassionate because she's, she's experienced it on a different level because she's somebody that's going to drive real change because to her, that's what we've always had to do. That's what women have to do to be in hockey. We have to be change makers. And I think that her getting that role just proved to everybody, both in hockey and basketball and soccer and, and, football and, and anything that you can't necessarily discredit a woman before you give her the opportunity to run with the job. You know, yeah, we haven't yeah. seen that. Absolutely. Yeah. I hear a woman get that option. I see it. And then we can even piggyback that to the NHL. Cammy Granato is a scout for the new um, Seattle franchise coming in. Yep. And that was another major barrier that, you know, was broken, you know, first female pro scout in the, in the national hockey league. And I think she's going to do a tremendous job with that team. I mean, her Completely. hockey, her her hockey IQ is up there as well. Totally, and they also have Blake Bolden on board. There's a couple other scouts that are rolling through. You know, I know of some of my friends being interviewed. So there's a lot that's happening right now in hockey to understand where women might see a player that's more dynamic because they're not looking for the big hits or they're not looking when they have the puck or they're not looking at how they're responding to A, B, and C. They're more looking at footwork and skill and speed and trying to understand how this player would fit within a larger organization more, maybe not more methodically because I, I don't, I don't scout the men's <laughs> game, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, but, but they're looking at it from a different lens always because it's just been a different life. And I think that it's so important when you integrate these folks, like I said, in any sport, women's hockey and hockey and men's hockey is starting to see these kind of inroads start to draw, but it's happening everywhere. I mean, even, if you look at our leadership group in Toronto, Ty is a, is a baseball person. And she comes from Major League Baseball, an affiliated Major League Baseball. And ball that is really high quality. And when she's able to articulate the value of sport, you listen. She commands a room and she's pretty sweet. And from there, we started to learn this is what women bring to sports in general and i think that all of these different innovators and pioneers that are getting these opportunities like cammy like blake 
like Florence, like Ty. They, I mean, they're just kicking ass. I mean, they're just kicking <laughs> ass. Like, it's good stuff. Yeah, I mean, and, and for me, like, I, I, I love all sports, too, like hockey, you know. But, you know, I see in the NFL, uh, 49ers have an assistant. Who's yes, in, Katie uh, Sowers. Woman. Yeah, Katie. And then Becky Ham is an assistant down with my Spurs down in San Antonio, <laughs> who, who personally I think will be the next coach <clears throat> of the San, San Antonio Spurs once Greg Popovich decides to retire and move <laughs> yeah. on because cause I just think she's the best. She does great work for that team. Um, but, yeah, it's just – it's great to see women just doing so well in all sports – um, and then just going real back, going back to the Twitch thing for a minute. Do you think you, do you think you guys are going to keep staying? Obviously the model's working there. I know I was listening to you, um, with Ryan Payton on Sirius XM last week. You guys talking maybe getting on ESPN. Do you think you are going to try to go TV way or stay with the streaming? Because it seems like streaming is the way of the future. Yeah. Well, streaming is working for us and we have a three year deal with Twitch. So we have two more seasons with them at minimum. Um, and there's, there's, in my opinion, no reason to leave that platform ever from now until forever. There's no reason to leave it because they're continuing to procure big leagues. They're continuing to procure big nights. Um, they have some NFL content there. They have, um, so many different leagues now going to game there, which is meaning that they're attracting their fans there, which only is a natural progression to putting content on there. Um, So there's so many pieces of the puzzle that are fitting in very well for Twitch, which I think is tremendous. And on the other side, that also means that we can sell broadcast rights to um, television. Like MSG networks and all that? Yeah, they wouldn't be competitive. They would be hand in hand as well. So we'll still remain on Twitch. And and that's where I believe you'll get a majority of women's hockey content and and NWHL content. And then if we're able to bring some of our content to mainstream television, that's another set of eyes that we can capture that's another metric that we can use when we start selling these sponsorships and it also helps normalize women's hockey there there are so many people on twitch that are saying what is this i'm so excited to learn more and that's <laughs> it's like you know what i mean they're like wait are these women and they're like oh my gosh what and that's the reaction that we need to continue to drive i was saying actually yesterday um there's there's more people that need to learn what women's hockey are is and respect that it's a thing than that actively choose not to watch it, you know? Like, yeah, I agree. It's I'm... just that no one knows, and that's hard. You have to, like, educate. Like, you can go to the grocery store and walk around and, and realize that nobody else in the whole building knows what you're doing. Yeah, and it's true. It's one of the things I actually – I remember two years ago uh, when the games were in Pyeongchang, I was watching Team USA women's hockey. Before they got to Canada, I was, like, blown away with – how amazing skillfully graced these women skaters are versus the men's no offense to Scott Niedermeyer. But when I watched that women's gold medal game versus Canada, that was the most exciting I've ever felt since uh, USA Canada men's in Vancouver was when Parise scored that tying goal. And that was, and it became that women's game became such a nail biter to the shootout. And I actually, I thought it was more inter- entertaining than any of the recent uh, sports events I've watched in a long time. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. When you take the women's game and you put it on a platform that, um, you know, means something to every person in the world, the Olympics is such a meaningful event, and you put it on um, – it was at, like, 3 a.m., so you were just like me. I, I was sitting in my Yeah, bed. I was watching New up. Jersey yes. time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we're watching this game and and choosing to watch it at an inconvenient time, which I think is super important to reference as well. We're choosing to watch it. And on top of all of that, we're enjoying it. It's high quality. There's not those big goony hits. There's like there's passing that you just don't even recognize or even comprehend that that's going to happen in this game. Everyone just assumes that women's sports are going to be lesser than. And it's not until you watch a game that invokes some feeling that you think, oh, wait, hold on. No, this actually is really relevant. So we actually lean on things like the Olympics or Worlds or um, Four Nation and these great international events to then draw the eye back. You know, we watch the women's soccer team do it almost flawlessly where they, they win another World Cup and they use that whole campaign to draw the eye back to the NWSL. 
and we see attendance rates grow. They're now signed with CBS Sports as well as Twitch um, for their upcoming season, which, you know, I'm knocking on some wood that that happens. <laughs> yeah, later. I think we all we yeah, are. We're, yeah. we're all, all hoping we want to. Listen, back, I miss so. my NWSL WNBA fix in the summertime. Uh, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, and, you know, you know, everybody talks about it like every four years, you know, oh, uh, women's hockey, you know, that's that's like the popular thing. Oh, the women's game. Did you see this game? I'm like, yeah. Did you know they play outside yeah, the Olympics play too? Yes. Yeah, you play every day. <laughs> like I was tell- like, I-, I also, besides for last word on hockey, I do stuff for women's hockey tribune and I was watching all the rivalry series games and I couldn't believe the demand for it. They sold out a game. Canada, U.S. sold out a game in uh, a record crowd and 13,000 people in the Arrowhead Pond. I mean, that's ridiculous. Yes. Like the, the, there is a demand for women's hockey and it's just great to see. And, it, and, and not to ramble on, but, you know, before, like once all this stopped, I was like champ- campaigning on the, our website to say, hey, wait a minute. We're showing all these old NHL games. Why aren't we showing old women's hockey right. games, too? Because they're just as, as exciting. Absolutely. And there's so many pieces that need to fall in. You know, there needs to be so many, like so many pieces. There needs to be an increase in production quality. And that's something that we call for every single year. And we try every single year to make a big change there. And so um, that's another piece that the broadcast element will help us with is just getting the right quality of broadcast in the room so that it is functional uh, long term and that it does stand on its own. But there's so much that comes from the Olympic Games and and the World Cup and and all these different pieces. I I, want to just, like I said, keep that lineage to women's soccer because we watched it come to such positive fruition you know we watched women's soccer the nwsl go from doing well continuing to grow chugging along doing well to the women u.s women winning the world cup and then taking their whole campaign and saying now support us locally and then we watched these games portland thorns were selling out i mean i went to a sky blue game that had like ten thousand people there in new jersey it happened to be when we were at Red Bull Arena. We were at Red Bull Arena, okay. and it was an unbelievable game. We were playing the Orlando Pride. The Orlando Pride was selling out. I mean, those are the things that when we start to use our, our energy to drive it back home, we can bring to light that these players are playing every single week. They're playing every week, and they're accessible, and they want to see you there. And if you go to a game, you can get their autograph. They're right there. And that's different than the men's game on any and any field on any team in any uh, league right now is just how accessible women are because they have to make themselves that way to continue to drive that fan experience so it's great for the fans it might you know the athletes might give us a hard time like hey I just want to roll out and like have a muscle milk and chill <laughs> and we're like no get yeah. my autographs but it's one of those things that it just drives continued relationships you know you go to a Riveters game and you feel like part of the Riveters you're not just spending 200 bucks on devil's tickets going to the game and then leaving being like that was all right yeah i I know i know what you mean on that we know Um, (laughs) yeah we know it was funny um speaking of like feeling like a part of the team uh you know when you know during the year um the prudential center has their you know the practice ring and i know a couple years ago like i'd go down you know just for the open skates or you know stick and puck whatever and you know the riveters be practicing and i got you know, got, you know, got to know a lot of the players and they would like text me and be like, Hey, we got practice. Can you come down? And we just want like more, we know you play. Can you just bring your speed and your game to the, to the competition? We just need that extra level. It's kind of like, we need, we need more. And I felt like, Oh, that's really cool that they're asking me to come down and play and, you know, just interact. And I see it all the time with the games that you're talking about lines and lines of little girls, even the boys are wanting autographs, you know, it's just great for the game. And, you know, just, I just wanted to plug you guys, uh, the, the draft is set for tomorrow and uh, Wednesday. Yes. And the draft is going to be so much fun. I'm talking about all of these interwoven relationships and, and the way that the draft is structured this year, I'm really excited for, and it's going to bring to life the support that we have and, and just the support that we can all lend one another. And I think that that is really important is you know, myself building a platform, that's tremendous and great. But if I'm not using it to lift everyone else around me up, then what's the point of it? You know? <clears throat> and I'm really yeah. excited for the draft because I think it's going to be that exact feeling and that exact emotion. There's some tremendous NCAA players coming into the fold. Uh, it's been a really good year for women's hockey on the collegiate level. So seeing that expand into the NWHL is hugely important. Those 
like I said, those players went to college knowing that they could play pro when they left. And I think that, you know, all those things are going to come into, come into fruition and I'm, I'm hyped for it. So, are you, so it's live on Twitter tomorrow? Yeah, it'll or be live on, on Twitter. It's, it's going to be really fun. It's going to be all tweets, all videos, all things through that um, channel or that uh, avenue. So follow us on Twitter, follow our hashtags, follow our league accounts and all of our um, personal or our um, team accounts that will be, you know, chirping and having some fun. We'll just, <laughs> you know, we try you know to make it as fun this. as possible because we like the engagement. I always find it so funny when people are, you know, chirping me or Maddie on Twitter. If that's that <laughs> thick skin that us hockey players have that I can take a chirp and be like, oh, oh, oh you know. Well, I want to ask you, Anya, what is the format of the NWHL's uh, drafting procedure? How similar is it to the NHL's? Yeah, so we do an internal draft so that we are um, internally, we know what's going on. We have, um, you know, things like our graphics bill, all those pieces, very similar to the men's league that are um, – maybe not happening full in full beforehand, but they are from a pick pool there. Um, then our trade rules are very similar. Um, so there's a lot of pieces that are, are similar. There's a lot of pieces that give us some um, power. And I think that in that it's, it's got to grow and it's got to change. And I think that, you know, the more we can offer salaries that evoke a move, you know, you can't, it's hard to tell somebody that um, might have a job in an area you know, you've been traded or drafted to this franchise, pick up and move your life. Uh, we're not there yet. So that's a yeah. piece that, that definitely stands in our way. It's a, it's a piece that we've recognized. And geographically, you'll find some areas just predominantly have uh, better youth leagues and better youth programs. So then they have more collegiate programs and they have more, the players develop more roots in an area. Um, so some teams will remain stronger than others just geographically. I think that that change is probably a few years away, but getting to the point where we can pay these players enough to live for those um, in-season months and live comfortably and live appropriately is hugely important. It's something that's always circled on my whiteboard. So the draft is <laughs> really important, um, but it's also, as we continue to increase salaries, it will continue to rise in um, importance and understanding, you know, drafting a player where we want that player to go regardless, um, as opposed to understanding their life and drafting them appropriately. So I don't know. That's kind of a long answer, that's, but it's yeah. No, no, no it's but it's it's really good detail because you know a lot of our listeners they they may not understand what goes into the NWHL with their draft because everybody's so used to watching you know the pro league drafts you know with the with the um, NFL just being on and NHL drafts like everybody wants to know and you know the one thing I noticed you know with with um, with your role as a PA director. Um, is you guys seem to have a more cohesive and, you know, um, you guys are always on the same page with, uh, with the commissioner as well. You guys seem to work together more than I see with like the NHLPA and the NHL. Yeah, I, I, we built a good partnership. And I think a lot of that um, came out of necessity. When you hear a lot of call for change, there has to be a way that you work to change together. And if we're just changing on our own and we're not, working hand in hand with the, the leadership group, especially in this startup climate, it's not going to work. You know, I could say I want salaries no lower than $50,000 tomorrow. And if we're not growing a sustainable business together, it will fold. And then we're going to be stuck in the same position where we're recreating another league and going through the same challenges. So we kind of borrowed the idea from the NWSL. <clears throat> I spoke to their PA leaders in the wake of, of last off season. And I said, what, are you doing? Because the NWSL is growing. Their salaries are growing tremendously. They just negotiated a great CBA. But we all know women's soccer to be fairly contentious, whether they're disbanding and restarting or they don't, the ownership group is not appreciating the players or, you know, there's always just been a little bit of a chip in that, in that women's soccer world. And what they said was we decided to lean in and stay the course and build it from what we had. And I thought that that was a really wise way to look at a air quotes problem and say, let's take, <laughs> right? I have to throw air quotes in there. But that's like, if the problem is, is apparent, how do you get to the solution? And from us, it was going to the league head office saying, these are the things that we want long term. How do we do this together? And how do we increase things like salaries or, um, you know, medical staff or support staff for the GMs or the GM role in, in entirety? Like, 
how do we build this? And so we came up with this model and we came up with this idea and the way that we were going to do it was through a revenue share. And we looked at our largest potentially growing streets. You know, we don't look at jerseys and jerseys because that's pretty finite. If you don't have a ton of fans, you're not going to sell a ton of jerseys. Sharing that 50-50 isn't really going to make a huge difference. But one company coming in and saying, okay, we want to give you a half a million dollars for, or $250,000 for the category of, I don't know, skates or gear or whatever. That increases our players' salaries by 11% right there. And those Mm. kind of things can drive real change. And so that's where we started. And from there, we became partners, you know, because the success of one deal affects us both equally. So that's, I think, where we kind of change the dynamic of, of contention to partnership. And I think that that's also established a lot of good. You know, our PA has said, we want more and better equipment and accessibility to such. We want to build a committee that's co-chaired by the PA and the league head office that's working on that. And that's something that the league was like, yes, I approve. We want your support in that way. And it forces us all to work together towards things that we would call um, – you know, rougher spots. And we've driven so much change by this joint effort. You'd be so shocked to hear what companies say back to us when they go, wait, you guys are working together on this? And it becomes much easier, (laughs) right? The buy feels good or the investment feels good or the sponsorship. They know that the players are are fully supportive of that idea. They want to become brand ambassadors. It's not the league imparting this product on people that don't care about it. It's a group of people all together saying, we want to work with you company X, Y, Z. It's such a, it just changes the whole conversation. You'd be shocked. Sometimes we yeah. talk to companies. No, no it's great. I, I, I imagine like I coming from like, I work in school now, but coming from the business world, it's so, I mean, pe- when businesses, you see people come in and you're like, yeah, we're working together. They're yes. like, wait, what? Yeah, so they're like, oh, <laughs> God, I wish everyone was like this. Because they go through contract negotiations. Yeah, exactly. And so then the easy. PA kicks it back after the league accepts it. Oh, my gosh. So we're just like, we'll figure it out and we'll work on it and we'll just tell you what we want. And then we go back with an RFP and they're like, this is very easy to perform yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> So we we see Dunkin' Donuts as a big like sponsor, not just in the NHL but also the National Women's Hockey League. So, can you tell us how much they really mean to the NWHL in not just growing the revenue, but also like using that kind of money to expand on the youth hockey uh, for the the girls side of things? Yep. They do tremendous work. They want, and their goal was, they came to us with this idea five years ago or almost six years ago now. They were the first sponsor of the league in year one. We want every hockey parent, hockey mom, hockey dad, to quintessentially think of that cup of Duncan as you walk into the rink. And we can live that brand, right? We want that too. And we often are coaches and we walk into the rink with a cup of coffee in our hand. And most of the time it's Duncan because of where we're at, like geographically. So we could really dive into that. And what they've done was, I mean, even just through the NWHL alone, they did camps in every market. They did um, appearances with Cuppy, their mascot, and brought their <laughs> players on the ice. And they paid the players to do that at a pretty impressive rate. And, and they, just, they just leaned into hockey as a whole. And they didn't disparage between men and women. And I think that that was one of the, the companies that became an innovator. So when we could turn and have other conversations with these big brands, we would say, well, Dunkin' owns our quick service restaurant market. This is what that looks like. This is what that category performs like for them. And then we're able to drive that value back to our players by getting them access to Dunkin' products, which they were probably already buying in a partnership that then allows them to become micro-influencers. It allows them to lean in as much as they possibly want or be you know, to the bare minimum if that's how they feel. But a lot of times you find that people then invest in Duncan and they then get behind it or they show up to the game with a coffee in their hand and they're, you know, waving it because it's a Duncan coffee. So you start to (laughs) see our fans like live this brand with us and it becomes this huge proof of concept that women's sports is both investable but also scalable. Um, And I thought that was they were such an innovator in that space. And it's led to so many great conversations within the Duncan team as well as beyond. beyond to other markets and other and other categories and i mean and i was gonna say jim uh 
to Anya, what with the way a lot of these uh, like money coming in being allocated, do you see a lot of that money being subsidized to help new players, you know, for their daughters, nieces to take up the sport from beginning to professional days? Do you see that kind of program? Yeah, I think that that's important. I mean, USA Hockey does a try hockey free program where our players go out and start to get gear in the hands of players and, and allow them to uh, experience the sport. I mean, even Franklin, which we know is the um, street hockey company that, you know, always has the sticks and the pucks and, and all those, but they provided us gear to hand out to um, our fans at the all-star game this year. And that was another really cool piece is not only are we working with a brand that obviously supports hockey and supports women and wants to grow, but also wants to get, a stick handling puck in the hands of kids that maybe don't get on the ice every day. So it's just different things that help fuel that drive. And like you said, the, the transition from just a spectator to uh, a learned escape, to trying to high school, the college, to hopefully getting to the pros. It, it inspires these dreams and all of that comes from people that are willing to invest, whether that's money and whether that's like Duncan hosting the camps or like Franklin providing the gear and support um, or all these different pieces that are going to be necessary because we know hockey to be very expensive and we know it to be um, it's, it's yes. super expensive. Yes. Uh, it yes. super limiting and it can be exclusive. And that's the opposite of what we want. We want it to feel inclusive. We want it to feel like it's, it truly is for everybody. And that's how all these brands have carved out their little uh, section of support in that way. And that's been amazing to work with. And, yeah. And I was thinking, do you think you'll get more women's hockey uh, throughout the state of New Jersey for high school sports, et cetera? In New Jersey specifically? N- not just New Jersey, just in- including all over yep. the U.S. and throughout places that usually don't have those kinds of sports markets for women, women's hockey in general. Yes, I think that the more it's seen and the more – young girls can believe it's possible, they will beat that transitional period. So 13 is about the year that girls stop playing sports, whether that's because they're not confident or they don't feel empowered enough or they don't feel like they can. Um, that, that's the year that's a pivotal moment for youth girls um, and, and how they experience sport. If at that age they can look up and see Jillian Dempsey, Kaylee Fracken, Madison Packer, Corinne Bowie, Taylor Kersey, uh, Allie Thunstrom. I mean, there's there's an inspiration in every market. Uh, Casey Anderson, Emma Vlasic, Cheyenne D'Arcangelo. I could name one from every team. Amanda Kessel. Amanda Kessel or yeah. you know, any of those players. You know, you can look up and see somebody that's doing it. And from there, what you yeah. learn is that you can too. And then the person in the mirror doesn't look that weird to you, you know? As a kid, I was always made fun of because I would rather go play hockey than than see a friend or I would rather um, stick handle a puck than do, I don't know, literally anything. <laughs> I would shoot yeah. pucks through my mom's yeah, garage no. door, which like it's still dented and broken. And like, she's like, one day you'll buy me a new garage door. But, you know, like those are the things that those are things that when you can see it, you'll start to have more. Uh, kids stay in the game and when they're staying in the game then high schools are going to have to provide the opportunity so all of it will be a chain reaction like i said six years in those high school kids are now knowing that they can play pro now you're going to have seven years in so bring it back to sophomore year then next year you'll have eight years bring it back to freshman year you're going to have these kids that can continuously grow and continuously know that at 13 years old she could be Madison Packer and that's sick. And that's going to keep her in the game and probably going to create an entire team for her high school because she's going to tell her friends and they're all going to stay in the sport. Absolutely. That's something we definitely need. Uh, Just looking uh, for next year. I know this year you guys had a 24 game season next year. You're going to have 20 game season to start a little later for uh, the women's worlds. Obviously is pushed back a year. Um, just any reasoning behind. Yeah. So when we added our sixth team, it made the scheduling a lot cleaner. So what we can do is have two home games and two away games per matchup. And that way it it helps us limit the amount of odd hand travel. So last year we had the Riveters drive up to Boston for a Saturday game, no Sunday game and come back. Um, So we're trying to clean up their scheduling so that they're getting, you know, what, what the PA has requested two games in a weekend, 
good travel dates, meals, and per diem. All these certain things that we've uh, you know, made appropriate for the weekend and then keeping it similar. This year, the Riveters played Boston, I, I think like five times in the first two months of season and then didn't see them again until almost the last week of the, the year. And had we normalized that a bit better, they would have, I think, taken them to task. And that's what we need is to create this this more appropriate and more normalized schedule that is much more methodical. And that's something that the 16, 20 game series changes for us because then the other way is to go to um, 30 games and have it be a home game and away game. And then maybe another series, either home or away. And so to keep it completely even, it would either have to be 20 games or 40 games. So we opted for 20 this year. We're extending our postseason by month. So postseason will be longer. Our teams will have longer to play together, to gel, um, get some more postseason or excuse me, preseason, preseason games in there as well. Um, so that in our first puck drop in the NWHL in November, those teams are now much more cohesive. And I think that that's also really important as well as now we're eyeing a, a different playoff structure. So there's so many things that are coming to fruition here that is driven by a uh, six team adding to balance our schedule, but also us maybe taking a, a come a step to now start to right side. And if every time we build, we add two teams at a time, we'll always be in a place to have this normalized schedule. And actually, I just want to hit on that, um, that eight to 10 mark, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, who are the next two, four teams that you're looking to expand on? Which markets are you looking at next? I can give you my personal opinion on the league level. There's certainly probably more decisions and there's probably more, um, more actuality and more truth to it. Uh, but in my opinion, I think that Pittsburgh is always a great market. We've done a lot of really great work with the innovators at the Pittsburgh Penguins and they have a phenomenal rink in Cranberry. They have, a great fan base. They're super progressive. So that I think is all signs leading to a great franchise make. I think that you have the same type of feeling in um, Washington. I think the DC market is hungry for women's sports. The mystics just won last year and they, they showed that women can and will change inside the DC market. And I think that that was massive. So I love DC. I love Pittsburgh for those reasons, obviously naturally Montreal sounds like a really appealing market that Canadians Ooh. have always yes please the Canadians Ooh. have always been a great yes. supporter of the growth of the women's game and I think that that is something that we can't forget right if the Montreal Canadians are behind it you have to think that that would make perfect sense and then like we said in the very beginning playing on some natural rivals that's another team that just people want to hate and it's a great spot <laughs> to put a team it's I yeah. I love those natural yeah. rivals yes. um Definitely. Everybody does. Uh, what do you think about uh, potentially down in like Florida, the Tampa Bay area? I know they have a lot of Listen, good and then we had our, our national team was centralized down there. The NWHL sent a team down to play some games against them. I think that Florida would be a great place. Also a very easy place to live. So um, that's another fun part or even Nashville for that. Nashville's a great Nashville. 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 I was just going to so say Nashville. The Nashville yes. Predators fans are so progressive. And that's another thing, right? Like if we have to account for, Fans in the arena, you cannot forget that the fans that you have in that market have to be ready for women's hockey. I could say, you know, as long as the the day is long that I want XYZ team to get it, but we might know their fans to not necessarily be super accepting or not necessarily be super open to the idea of of accepting something different. And then then it could all make sense, but it wouldn't be right. Um, so then, and then on the flip side, let's throw it the complete left left field. What about um, Seattle? They're adding a men's team. We could parlay that love and support right into a women's franchise. And, ma- <laughs> and maybe split some ice. That would be great. Yeah, there's no yeah, split some ice, and you guys got everything to put a women's team anywhere. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, speaking of, um, you know, the All Star Game this past year, uh, another success. Boston, you guys have any ideas where you're going this year? Just I, I know I'm trying to push, I'm pushing you, <laughs> I love it, but trying to get an insider. But I'm, I'm trying to get you know, trying to push for it. But do you guys have ideas I where you want to go the right best now? Places to have a franchise, or excuse me, to have a an all star game is somewhere where we do not have a franchise. 
every time we can bring a set of folks, either, you know, the loyal fans that are going to go to the game, drive, fly, train, bus, however they get there, they're going to go. And then you have the other side, which is just the introduction. I was talking earlier about the education. Like people just don't know who we are yet. So, you know, you look at markets that are mm-hmm. tremendous in terms of cost of living, in terms of fandom, in terms of, you know, needing something to rally behind you. Detroit pops up to my top of my head. Then obviously we mentioned Florida. Florida is one of those ones that an all-star game would perform tremendously well. Um, we had one in Minnesota. We expanded to Minnesota. We had some really good games in uh, Pittsburgh following the Pittsburgh all-star game. Nashville was a great all-star game. I've never been so well respected in an area and treated so well by um, an entire team staff. They're just great people. And great it was people. Insane. Amazing crowd. Yeah, and they, it's, and Great the crowd people. Yeah. We had the highest attendance for the NWHL in history. There was, I, I couldn't even have like painted that picture better myself. Boston this year was just full. It was exciting. It was energetic. There were so many sponsors that leaned in. You know, Norma Tech put forth a whole recovery zone for all of our players. So our players had a phenomenal experience. I don't know. I think that you're going to find it in the non-traditional market that is the right place for a potential expansion longer term. I don't think it's going to be one of the teams that I said should be the expansion in the next expansion pack. But if we start sowing the seeds in like a Detroit that has a team an hour away in Toronto, maybe that becomes or two hours away. I think that's a two hour drive. But either way. Yeah, because yeah, Windsor yeah, right Windsor's right across the border. Like Sarnia is right there, too. Um, <clears throat> but you have to. Yeah. You have to think that it's good because it expands where we're looking at. You know, Detroit's in a major revitalization. It would be a tremendous place to be. But also, it gives us some time for those seeds to to route into some plants. So um, all of that becomes uh, part of the strategy. So I think it's going to be a non-traditional women's hockey market that might not be the most obvious place for an expansion pack. Gotcha. Thank that, you. That was a pretty good. That was a pretty good. <laughs> the ideas for expansions. Yeah, I know, <laughs> right? It really I'm was thirsty for all this information that a lot of people really don't think about. Even during times like these, I just always think about like we're at six teams, but it's good to think about the next eight to ten, and you know, go yes. from there. But I do want to touch on like, for instance, Seattle has everything from Microsoft to Apple, Costco like all in the West that you could have for possible uh, people that could be buying season tickets. Yep. How are season tickets going through in the non-traditional uh, new markets? Season tickets are a huge push for us because not only does that mean that we have a long-term um, viable fan, but the second somebody comes to two games, they're more likely to invest in, in things like shirts or things like apparel or things like posters or, or what have you. So there really is a drive for us to, procure fans and keep fans and when we watch like minnesota have the most after their first year or even the first announcement they had the most season tickets so we're also finding that in markets that just have um that deep love you know the hockey community that is just so deep-seated that we're going to start to see that the growth in season tickets i think season tickets is always a place that we can do better um i think that everyone should right in my mind i want to be a season ticket holder (laughs) Yeah, I, I mean, every, you look at all sports, they all say the same thing. Yeah, our season It's hard, and it's hard to make year. somebody commit like, long-term yeah, because now we are all fear of commitment, right? We're all on our phones, or we're constantly busy, right, yeah. or we're not going out, or we're canceling plans. Like It's hard to get somebody to commit long-term to support the NWHL. Now, on the flip side, season tickets for women's hockey are pennies in comparison to what they are for the NHL. Very cheap. Um, yeah, it's so, cheap. Like, yeah. Madison and I buy a season ticket in every market because – a why why not like we can support the league um, <laughs> yeah why not exactly it's, it's, exactly we, we need to commoditize itself and we need it to start to grow and i think that season tickets are a place that you know like you said every league could do better in everyone wants guaranteed ticket sales um and i think that that's something that we can majorly lean into ticket sales in general is something that i think that we can lean into um there's some markets that perform really well and have sellout audiences and, and crush it and there's some that don't, and we need to figure out what that is and why. Um, and it's I think, not that people don't care. I think one of the things that I enjoyed yeah. before a Devils game, they always had like some sort of fan yes. fest. And one of my favorite things was uh, this: the the it was like always the ball hockey in the uh, in the Championship Plaza that I always enjoy and I miss before those games. And I think it would be awesome to have like all you know NWHL games have those sorts of 
fan interactive games that would get people ready before the game and you know get ready to have fun during the game yes so i agree do you think that'll be integrated i think the nwsl does that best out of all women's leagues is to create fan zones and fan experiences i also went to a WNBA game a playoff game and the experience i had as a fan was was second to none it was amazing i mean madison and i happened to get courtside tickets like i don't i don't even know how like you know when you think about like the quality of person sitting at courtside i was like who are we to be sitting here you know i was like i was like i feel so little yo courtside yo (laughs) courtside that was just an unbelievable experience but what we learn every time we we experience our or you know widen our network to different leagues and different in different experiential ideologies you know how do we make this a thing? And I think that Boston started to really lean into that is create these fan zones. Every team this year made a make a poster section. Um, and, and there's just different things before, you know, when a parent walks into a rink with a kid, it's like, can you do something for these 20 <laughs> minutes while they cut the ice? Um, so we start to remember that this has to be an experience and it has to be something that you want to go back to. I don't know if either of you guys have ever been to an Orlando Magic game. Yes, it's an experience. I have been to one Orlando Magic game a long time ago. A very long time ago, I was down there on vacation. I went to a Magic game. I couldn't (laughs) tell you what I would remember about it, but I went to a Magic game. Look at the Magic. They have so much connectivity to Disney that they create this experience. And you're going to a Magic game. Yeah, that's awesome. But you also leave with this wild experience. Um, And I think that that's the kind of thing that we want our players or our fans to leave with. And then remember that the product that they saw was second to none. But if you don't, if you don't think that every single league needs to create these long-term experiences so that the fans want to come back to the stadium, you're wrong. That's that's where every league struggles. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you see it. You see it everywhere. You know, and one big thing is like now, like I don't know if you guys have thought about this. I know one of the big things that drives me to watch. Like I'm big Giant fan, but I've turned into the fact that, hey, I care yes. more about my fantasy team now than I do about what the Giants do. And I don't know if you guys are, are going to start to interact, maybe like a fantasy hockey type type deal for the NWA show, or maybe getting to like that. I know this is like, um, you know, one of the things like a lot of pro sports leagues do, but like the gambling aspect of it. I think like, is there any talk about doing you know, that? We see the W creating a partnership with DraftKings and, and doing it in that way. I think that's a, the right avenue. When you can start to monetize and commoditize women's hockey beyond just, you know, hey, I love hockey and I want to buy tickets or I want to buy a jersey, I'm, I'm a big fan. And you can start to make it a game that, that affects us all. You know, Madison gambles on football and it might drive me, <laughs> it might drive me up a freaking wall. Yeah, but she's like, I need the lucrative. Browns to cover the spread. I'm like, the Browns suck. She's like, you should, yeah, she's like, you should do the spread though. The Browns like, suck. The thing. These, these things make us watch the Browns. I'm not a Cleveland Browns fan. I'm a Pats fan. But right. not anymore because I'm so mad at the past. <laughs> Yo, Gronk and Brady. Like, you have to a different era now. Yeah, seriously. Oh my gosh. So, but you have to start to make these these experiences more fun. And a lot of that comes with putting some skin in the game. You know, when you have something to lose on the game, then then, then it's important. Or when your fantasy team is gonna lose you bragging rights to your freaking mom for a whole year. Yeah, that stinks. <laughs> you don't want that. Like yeah. welcome to my nightmare, but but these are the things that, that we all look at. And I think that those um, those different organizations are starting to look at women's sports in that way because it's untapped. So where the rights to the yeah. NHL or the NFL or the MLB or all these different fantasy leagues are super expensive. The same thing about our season tickets is we're not there yet. So if we have a company that's willing to lean in and create the road – then they can help alongside us, which obviously fair market price has to come in there at some point, but, but they can start to, to create. What Absolutely. It looks like. And from there we can set a price on it. Yeah. If no one's ever <laughs> done that before, we're not going to hold that market and say it's a $5 million category. We might say, okay, well you're going to profit quite a bit. Let's call this a, a half a million dollar category. And then we'll add another half a million dollars. If you exceed X, Y, Z in expectations. That's something that you can actionably look at and then say, okay, but that also increases players' salary by 20%. So with that in the shoe deal or the equipment deal I was talking about, there's 30% right off the top that the players are going to get in the bonus. It's pretty dope. Exactly. Yes. It, yeah, it is. I mean, I would love to I would love to see it, to be honest. Be like, oh, yeah, I can gamble on this game. Rivers, or the Buttes. Yes. Pride. All right. Yo, what's the 
yeah, or if you can whatever. Or you can throw like, some yeah, cash throw down this, and yeah, throw a couple bucks. another Hattie in the third period. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yay. Or, or, or yeah. Madison's going to go between oh, the legs to shoot out. This, this should be thrown on NHL Network, honestly. It, but I do want to talk about all things fun and interactive is that I love goal songs and traditions and stuff like that. Um, New Jersey has a New Jersey band in Gaslight Anthem. They play Howl for the goal song. Um, are there any like uh, local bands that play goal songs? If there is any in uh, the NWHL? No, so we haven't had that yet. We always, uh, we always play Brass Bonanza for, for the Connecticut whale. Um, and th- yeah, that can't change, obviously. You have to keep that. Keep that. <laughs> Just, for everybody that else, doesn't change. That like, doesn't change. Like team by team, create that song for those folks. But we haven't found or we haven't had that that level of community reach yet. Again, it's like an education piece. Um, but that's the stuff that I'm excited about. I'm excited for these long-term, um, these long-term, these long-standing you know, pieces of history to come into fruition. And every year I'm waiting for something to catch on like that. And then I hear like, I don't know, some current pop song. And I'm like, oh, not this one. Something else. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's it's going to happen is what I'm saying. It's it, it, it definitely. Uh, so I just saw um, the other day, you know, obviously, you know, Adam Schefter, their big NFL guy, he, you know, he apologized for his mistake. You know, he was a little excited about saying this was the first, you know, a pro sport sporting event happening since coronavirus. <laughs> and some people took him to task for, you know, hey, guys, what about the WNBA draft? And I was like, yeah, you, you know what? He's right. Um, what are your thoughts on, you know, what, how successful that went for them, you know, being the first virtual draft I since, thought they did such you know, a great job. And started. I thought that they kept the excitement up. I mean, I'm a big fan of the W, and I think that what they do is, uh, out, you know, outstanding. It sets the tone for a lot of what we do, um, a lot of what all women in sports do. But I think that just the way that they were able to turn on a dime, respond, um, Kathy, Kathy, their new uh, commissioner is a tremendous visionary and, and she comes to them from Deloitte. And I think that she brings a lot of experience and I thought that they were unwavering. And I think that when women stand strong, um, people listen. And I think that that's the most important piece that they can possibly add to sports and being the first league to do it with as much success as they had and as much conversation as they started. And, and even social was blowing up. There was people watching it. People were videoing their reactions. People were tweeting about who was going to go next and just getting invested in women's sports. And it also increased how much people were looking up NCAA ball on the women's side because they just weren't educated, you know? And, and it drove a lot of conversation beyond just, oh, yeah, the women's draft is on. Let's, like, play that as background noise. People were watching it and and. and recognizing that it was sports and and I think that what we saw after that was some people that weren't part of the enlightened group and you can't knock them for that um, I think that it's hard to take somebody that wasn't aware that the W had a draft before that or whatever and and put them on one for making a simple mistake I mean he definitely recanted and said hey you know that was on me there's certainly people on the other side of the fence that are like, oh, women's basketball yeah. shouldn't be considered a pro sport. Like, that's a joke, and those people should be blasted. Yeah. No yeah. question. That, re- right that, that really is a up. joke. Yeah, no, uh, a but joke. I think that when we have these conversations that start, no, but- and even that one tweet just sparked so much conversation, uh, that was an education. And those are those, like, milestones that might hurt and might make us feel some type of way. Like, it might make us feel like crap when someone says that. But then you remember that that gives us an open door to just slam it down and educate. And I think that that experience helped so many W players become household names that this upcoming season, again, I'm knocking on like all the wood. When it comes to, when it comes to people are going yeah. to be excited about the W. And that's what excites me about that whole scuffle is that it turned into a really great time for the W players to stand up and be like, you want a ball against me? I don't think so. <laughs> so, so I want to yeah. talk about um, when you were a player, what led you to become the NWHL PA executive director? What was the motive that got you in there? Yeah, I was the PA rep for Connecticut. And I recognized that there needed to be change. And I recognized that together we could create something really powerful and, that we needed to have a voice. And so in that role, um, the PA executive director at the time stepped down and we had to elect somebody. 
I was chosen, which was beyond my like comprehension of, you know, <laughs> what I could possibly do in my life. Um, but chosen to start to lead that group. And in that, I, I obviously had some hiccups and I had some learning moments. But what I did was start to appreciate the the complaints and appreciate the um, challenges that people were having. And, and as they were pointing them out, listen to them and feel them and know as a player, I agree. And how do we get something better for ourselves and how do we drive that change? And so every moment that I have had since the day that they said that I was the executive director was to understand where the problems are and where is a pathway to success. Some pathways might be a two minute phone call and I solve the problem. Some pathways might be a six month long build to find a solution. Some might be a five year long build. And so every time I'm faced with a hurdle, I, I try to appreciate where it lives in my life and how immediate it can possibly be solved and then try to shorten that timeline. Um, so I think that there's so much excitement behind yeah. the growth of women's hockey and, and it's pretty easy to just love it and watch it and be pumped. <laughs> but there's also a whole other side of the business that needs to be strategic. And we were talking about the collaboration and the partnership with the league head office. I think that that's, you know, a feather in, in the PA's cap and something that all of the players that are on my PA we're so empowered to fight for because that allows us a seat at the table and just being the person that gets to represent those outstanding visionaries and players every day as their seat at the table. It's, it's beyond me. And it's, I'm, I'm so humbled by them. What, what I'm most humbled and excited about is that I was looking at the 2022 uh, women's hockey Olympics and I see that China's in it because of the host country, what does it mean for you and, you know, international women's hockey going forward in a huge market that's like, like a, like almost 2 billion people in population? Yeah, I mean, I, I was recently in a Harvard business school class, actually the PA um, sent a few members to join a Harvard business crossover into business program that allows pro athletes to take Harvard classes. And we were talking about Dwayne Waite. And I'll, and I'll tie this all together. I, yeah, I promise you I'll have a bow. But Dwayne <laughs> Wade signed a shoe deal with a company headquartered out of China as opposed to what was a natural progression of Nike or Jordan or all these different brands. And the reason he did it was he said, basketball's growing in that space. I want to be the face. I want to be the leader. I want to be somebody that can take basketball and the NBA international and, and, and ride that wave, essentially. And, and what he was saying right there is he was saying, there's intrinsic value in China that we're not yet tapping into. And I'm going to be the guy. Like, I'm going to be that dude. And you're going to look at me and say, wow, he's doing something. And that's where I think women's hockey is going. <clears throat> it starts with people like Digit Murphy, who's, you know, boomeranged her way back to leading the team in Toronto, which is, you know, beyond my comprehension of unbelievable because I love her. But <clears throat> we have these change makers in China that are starting to appreciate women's hockey and, and giving them more than we've ever seen women in hockey get and just leaning into that and knowing that women's hockey was so important in the winter Olympics. And if they will feel the team, they will a be good. They will be well-trained, well-fed the right equipment, the right gear, the right location to be playing, the right training facilities, all these things. And it's proving that, that that's a whole market that we aren't tapping yet. And we need to. And as we watch that league grow out there, we look in admiration because it's tremendous and they're doing great things and they're respecting and appreciating women and growth. And that's an entire market that we can continue to, um, that we can just continue to foster and continue to nurture and, and just be respectful of. And I think that that's hugely important with such the right, you know, amount of money and the, the right amount of support in the game that we can continue to build on that. That's outstanding. It, yeah. it's. It, I'm just looking forward to it. I mean, it's going to be great. I mean, everybody, you know, everybody talks about the Olympics and what they want, you know, what they want to see the groups. I mean, you got yep. Canada, U S in the same group in both the men's and women's. So that's going to be that the rivals right there. And you know what, in speaking of, you know, empowering, you know, looking what uh, Team Sweden was doing, you know, before the Nations Cup, you know, boycotting because they right. felt that they I mean, needed more support from a, a their further, head office. Um, what Finland was able to do and what they were able to accomplish. And then their nation leading it and saying, you might have lost in a shootout, but we're going to pay you as though you won. 
Right. Also, I think, oh, your phone lo- I think your phone locked out. Oh, yeah. no. I said I was so- <laughs> Yeah, I think your phone just locked out. You were saying, yeah, no, no, you're there. Yeah. No, no. Yes, they still uh, pay them as, as champions. The and I think that those and their, are the um, things that we and nation... see and we start to appreciate and respect that these federations are, are seeing value in their athletes. And they're seeing a return on their athletes representing their country so well. And that's what you get when women wear your logo. You know, they have an extra level of respect, an extra level of attention to detail. And they're going to represent you well. And they're going to continue to dominate. So I'm pumped and I'm pumped for the Olympics and all these different nations telling their stories and and watching these new stars emerge and then watching them continue to grow in the sport. Because as we all know, it doesn't stop every four years and restart again. Um, so trying to continue to follow these new stars as they emerge and whether that's through NCAA play and WHL or wherever they're playing, um, they're going to, they're going to really make a big difference and I'm excited about it. And do you think there would be a major junior slash AHL type thing for the women's league and then kind of have like a contract, where they can transition, you know, foreign players to the NWHL and et cetera, kind of like the NHL, but like a little bit more easier and equal than the NHL with like certain Europeans and players like that. I think it would be a tremendous idea. I don't think we're mature enough yet for that type of structure. Um, but I think that when we get to that eight ten team league that has um, a different, you know, hopefully more private ownership, hopefully more, um, of that more franchise type structure. I think that that could be something that would be huge because then you could have affiliate programs Um, right now when you have two teams that are privately owned and then uh, four teams that are owned wholly by the league, it's harder to build those affiliate connectivities because the league wants the league to succeed. So if there's a team that the Metro Riveters are in number one and their affiliate team has three players that would make Connecticut better, you don't want them to share that wealth. You want it to be a private owner. Um, so I think right now we're not stru- structured yet for it, but that doesn't mean it's not something that could potentially happen in the future. So, so this means no like Green Bay Packers <laughs> style ownership of like cooperatives. That doesn't, mean not, that doesn't mean that. I always thought that that was a cool way to do it too, is more make it a, a collection of owners. Um, I've always been interested in the Packers and, and how well they've done, especially in, um, listen, I, my last name's Packer now. So I see Packer fans everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's yeah no it's it's interesting yeah. to see how they do it you know with them being on the you know stock market and people like own them and stuff it's just really cool but it's so cool to see that like you have so many um privately owned teams in in the nwhl it just it just makes it you know this the success and everything is just rising it shows that the league is you know stabilizing and it's there and it's not going away anytime soon um and it's great to see because I, like I said, I've been a fan since day one. I love what you know women's hockey, and it's yeah, just, and it feels that way. It feels just, like it seems really like the sky's the limit right now. Continue to overachieve our our trajectories and our our plans. And I think that every conversation that we have with partners and every conversation that we have with NCAA players is empowering us to continue to pioneer down that pathway. This year was a year of resilience, and I think that if nothing else, we've proved that there's nothing that's going to stand in our way from continuing to provide a great product. Um, continuing to get these players the right notoriety, continuing to pay the players. And and that's something that's important to me. And that's why I believe my why is to continue to grow this league. And I've really enjoyed my moments here. So um, every day I wake up inspired and I know that that glass ceiling is cracking and we're about to shatter it. And from, from that moment to the close of my day where we got even an inch closer to progress, that's how I know that we're in the right spot. And can you tell us a story about how the Devils became the first NHL team to own the Riveters for a little bit for like the first two of those three years when they eventually won the Isabel Cup? So they were affiliated actually. They weren't in a private ownership model. Um, That was their partner. And so that all sparked from the need to bring a a youth development function to um, the girl side of the New York Devil, I mean, uh, the New Jersey Devils. And that comes from formerly our jerseys looked very much like the Rangers jerseys. And formerly we had a lot of connectivity to New York. Um, we had then moved the team to New Jersey with this partnership that then rebranded them as the Metropolitan Riveters, now focusing on New Jersey and 
and how that can change and grow and and bring different teams into the New Jersey youth organization. So there was a lot of push by New Jersey, the New Jersey Devils franchise to grow from the ground up. And I think that that's not something that went away. I think that in a lot of our partnerships, there became some hesitation, but that doesn't mean that the, the main goal dissipated. And I believe wholly that we will see a lot of these conversations reignite themselves because we want to continue to grow and develop. And I don't think there's any hurdles in our way. So I'm excited for what the future holds for all of our players and all of our teams and all of our franchises. But I'm really excited to watch how we reintegrate with um, our affiliate partners. And that's something that I'm excited for. And so, and so how are you going to get to expand I, the brand of the NWHL to everyone who's like either on, you know, local TV stations to, you know, social media, how are you going to, expand the yeah, I think growth it starts on that. with inking the right partners i think it starts with continuing to invest in brands that invest back in us you know some partnership deals might sound great but if they're not willing to give us uh, marketing campaigns alongside their partnership maybe that's not the right space to give a category away um so there's a lot of pieces that come into it that take mutual buy-in and that helps expand our reach tremendously i also think that that women supporting women is hugely important this COVID 19 is going to um, affect women at a staggering rate. You know, we see right now that the, the women's lacrosse league canceled its season and that's going to disproportionately affect women's lacrosse versus a male affiliate. Or we watch as the WNBA cancels a season, the NBA or not cancel, excuse me, postpones a season. The NBA postpones a season as well, but they just have so much more resource for their players. Um, so as women are disproportionately affected, they will also rise in a disproportional function together. And I think that together we are a lot stronger. The voice of women is specifically run by their own social media accounts. Women's footprint is wholly digital. You know, we're not these superstars that are in magazines or on the television all the time or all these things. Disproportionately, we are forced to create our own fame on our digital platforms. And I think that that helps us with the education is that if the W has millions of followers and millions of fans, if we can tap into that together and find a campaign to work wholly and, and work as one, then we're reeducating and expanding. And then once you get all the women sports fans on board, then you continue to have word of mouth. Then you continue to have campaigns with different brands. Then you have Twitch, which is killing it and then growing our fandom at a huge clip. So I think every piece of the pie is starting to fall into place. And I think that together we can all grow how much people care about women's sports. Yeah. And, and I can't, uh, I mean, you said it best right there. You know, it brings me to um, what Roger Federer was saying the other day um, in regards to the governing bodies of tennis. He said like the way everybody's working together, he's like, it would, it would be nice to have the ATP and WT, TA tours be under one governing body. And I'm like, just for him to say that, like one of the most respected tennis players in the world and all the men and the, and all the men's tennis players getting behind the female game because Andy Murray had his first feet, had that first right. family. Moresmo was the first female coach. You never every saw sport that before. Is making major strides so and every that, sport is, is making major strides driven by its athletes. And I think that that's where we know that some business, some business ideologies need to change. You know, we talked about Florence Schilling in the very beginning, but the more that we respect and appreciate change, the more that it will come naturally. And that's what we need. And that's what Roger Federer is driving. That's what's happening anywhere from, you know, gymnastics to swimming to hockey to, to golf. I mean, the LPGA Tour is killing it. And their co-branded events with their male counterparts are doing tremendously well. And normalizing that is something that we've seen the PGA Tour and the LPGA Tour finally get in lockstep on. And so when we watch all of these different groups start to lean in, women start to become on the forefront of the conversation. And that's when we drive real change. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and it's just great to see. And, you know, it's, it's just awesome that, that everything's yes. just going on and so many strides, so many strides forward. And it, I, I just can't wait for the upcoming season. Hopefully we get to have sports back. I'm knocking on wood to, that everything comes back, um, whether it's hopefully with fans, if it's not. Have you guys thought about a contingency if there isn't a lot of fan, yeah, fans? Yeah, I think that for us, involved? especially because, like I said, 
ticket sales have been challenging in some markets and we play at much smaller ranks. Um, we lean very heavily on our digital footprint. So um, Twitch gathering over 8 million eyes, even if every single rank in the entire league was sold out every single game, we still wouldn't even have, you know, a million eyes just because of the size of our ranks. So for us, we can be a little bit more malleable to um, a non, a, a no fan experience for the beginning of the season. If that's the route that we need to take, you know, women's sports, unfortunately due to uh, low pickup and low response don't always have a billion people in the stadium, but that doesn't mean that what they're doing isn't of value. So, you know, maybe you start to find TV and, and media lean into women's sports and say, Hey, if we're not doing fans, we want to buy your rights and we want to broadcast them. Um, that's definitely an idea. We haven't started that look yet because our puck drop is in November. So we certainly have a cushion, uh, but yeah. there's no, Nothing is off the table in terms of conversation and creativity that we're willing to put forth to continue to grow the game. Awesome. Yeah, before we wrap up, one of the last things I want to say is thank you for coming on. You're actually our first ever hockey executive of any kind to come on to the podcast. Uh, you brought a lot of great content. Um, what are some uh, little bits you want to tell our listeners uh, here and abroad that – what they should expect uh, in the next few months and the next uh, season that they should expect that no one's really thinking about. Yes, right I think now. one of the biggest pieces that I always like to leave people with is just to lean in, you know, whether that's supporting the game, whether that's retweeting, whether that's following or finding your favorite players, um, the more that we can lean into one another in any sport in any walk of life today, more than ever before, um, just from the amount that we all feel so disconnected, but just leaning in to support those athletes, changes tremendously what they're able to do with their lives. You know, you might have your favorite athlete that doesn't have a ton of followers, that doesn't have a ton of response or retweets, and they're, they aren't able to get deals or they're not able to, um, you know, continue to expand their brand. They don't have the ability like D-Wade to go to China and grow this multi-million dollar organization um, within your own brand. So first, I always just like to say, find what you like and share it and be comfortable telling the story and, and that's something that I think every single person should should do is is be comfortable being a storyteller so right there I want to start with that and then just thank you like anyone that streams our games or that yeah. that gets involved with women's hockey and that learns and debates and creates a healthy narrative and and wants to support that's all good stuff so the more that we can just be human to one another and the more that we can be kind and supportive and understanding those are going to be the qualities that when we leave this challenging time we change the world. And, and that's what I want to see as we head into season six is just people willing to lean in and change the world. That's what my goal is. That's always been my PA's goal. And I know that's our league goal. So I always like to end with the idea of just find something you love and, and make sure it's okay and make sure you normalize it and just change the world. That's <laughs> it. I mean, that's it. I, I'm, I, that, that's it right there. I love it. You know what? Better – that's the best way to end it. Really can't thank you enough again. Thank you. Thank you for answering me on uh, on Twitter. I uh, really appreciate it for you coming on and, and just spreading the word of women's hockey and the NWHL and just women's hockey in general because there's there's an avenue out there for people and they need to you know open their eyes and yeah, see what, what so a good product Thank you so much for having me. Everyone follow the NWHL on Twitter at nwhl and then on instagram it's nwhl.zone i'm anya packer and guys i couldn't thank you enough joe jim you guys thank you for the questions it was such a good conversation no uh, no thank, thank you no, thank you yes have a great have day, day everybody bye bye